First, I want to let you guys, all the, you guys who emailed me and texted me, threatened me, that I better be done before the Chiefs game start. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I will do my best. How about? So, as you can see, we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And, you know, we just finished going through the uh, Acts, all the book of Acts, about the beginning of the church, and, you know, the second half being primarily about Paul and his missionary journeys, his three missionary journeys, going to uh, starting these different churches uh, all over what we now know as Turkey and Greece and and he would go to one and, and preach the gospel, and then they'd get a few people together, and, and they would start a church. And so uh, what I wanted to do is kind of, okay, so we got all these churches all across this land that have been started. Uh, but you have to realize, especially if we talk about Corinth. Now, at first, there were some Jews who got saved, but then by this time, uh, Corinth is primary, primarily a Gentile church, more Gentiles, and they don't have a clue. I mean, they have no basis for the Old Testament. They have no grid for morality of the Old Testament. They live in a pagan culture. There's a temple there to Aparitus, who They have over a thousand prostitutes there. So it's a very secular culture. Uh, pagan culture. And so Paul writes this letter from Ephesus, and it's sometime in the spring, and it's unclear for sure whether it was AD 53, 54, or 55, because he's heard reports, so he writes a letter. But it's during the, the end of his three year period of being in Ephesus. And again, Ephesus was where he was. He was at that church longer than anywhere else, okay? So he gets a letter. He's writing it back. And Corinth was, it sets on the isthmus of, in Greece. So it's down in the southern part of Greece uh, that connects that to the peninsula below Greece. And it was a major trading between the Mediterranean and the GNC. So it was a, a big seafaring port where people would come, a lot of sailors would come through, there's a lot of trade. It was a Roman colony, and so it was under Roman law and under the Roman, basically, culture. So there was a, um, this is actually another letter that Paul wrote that's been lost to history, and he refers back to it in, I think, First Corinthians, or First Corinthians oh, chapter 5, verse 9. And it had to do, what we do know what it had to address. It had to address sexual immorality that was going on in the church. But it's been lost to history. And otherwise, we'd have First and Second and Third Corinthians. But it's only have the two. So Paul and Priscilla and Aquila, if you remember them from the uh, book of Acts, they spent 18 months in Corinth in the early 50s. It's not 1950, that's early 50s. And at some point, Paul had, again, written that letter. He's got another letter that has come back. And, and because, again, this, this church by now was primarily... Gentile, they had a lot of issues going on. Lots of issues. And so that's one thing we see as we read through all these different epistles. An epistle just means a letter. So he's writing these letters to these different churches because all the churches have some type of problem going on. Corinth had a boatload of problems. And if you want to, if you ever want to be a pastor of a church like that, good luck. I wouldn't want that job. So we're going to start in verses 1. We'll kind of go through verse by verse. I'm going to read the first three verses and then make some comments as we go through. So as it starts off, he says, Paul, 
called to be an apostle. Isn't that interesting? He was called by Jesus Christ. So he doesn't take it upon himself to decide, I'm going to be an apostle one day. He was called by Jesus, by the will of God, and our brother Sothenes. To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy together with those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. You might remember the name Sothenes because back in Acts chapter 18, he was a, one of the leaders of the um, synagogue, and he was actually one who attacked Paul. And if you remember, he got a mob together and brought him before Gallio, the, uh, the Roman council, and was going to bring charges against Paul. But when the council saw that it was just issues about their religion, you know, he said, I don't have time to listen to this. If it was a crime or something, I'd deal with it. And then it says a crowd beat Sothenes. Well, somewhere in the storyline, he got saved because here he is now with Paul traveling with him. And it says, uh, now mine in the NIV doesn't use the word as he's greeting them, saints. I think a lot of the other versions you have will say saints. And so often I think we get in the concept of, you know, like what Catholics call a saint. But a saint simply means one who is set apart. That one is set apart to be holy. So in other words, each of us in here are set apart to be holy. So we can start calling each other Saint Bill, Saint Nancy, Saint whatever, you know, you can start doing that because that's, that is true. It's just someone who has been set apart, received the grace of God. And it means holy people. Now, what we're going to find out is that the Corinthians were very divided and very self-centered. And it's interesting that Paul says grace and peace to you. Now, there's five times in the New Testament that that is used, grace and peace. And it's always used in that order, which means you can't really have peace unless you understand grace and receive grace. Because once you receive grace, and grace is just unmerited favor, something that's been given to you, you didn't deserve it. In fact, we all deserve hell but God has given us grace, his grace. And because of that grace that is given to us, we can walk in a place of peace. So it's always grace and then peace. Okay, let's look at verses 4 through 9. And he says, I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, you will not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, is faithful. So, because they had received God's grace, it was kind of demonstrated by the gifts of the Spirit. This was a very charismatic, Pentecostal-type church. Okay, They're moving in all the gifts, but, at the same time, they're very carnal. And I think a mistake sometimes we make that would apply to us today, that these gifts are not a measure of 
maturity or spirituality because God gives gifts. We grow fruit. And so you can have someone who is anointed, let's say with a gift of healing, and we're kind of all amazed as we see people get healed, or maybe they have that gift of, of prophetic words, and we are enamored by that, and yet themselves, they can be not mature at all, and as a result, if they're not growing in holiness and purity, they're setting themselves up for a train wreck. And when that happens, it's not only them, it's all those who sit under their ministry. So again, a gift is not necessarily at all a measure of spirituality. Now let's look at verses 10 through 12. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no division among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. So obviously there's division going on in the church, okay? My brothers, some from Cleo's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Paulus. Another, I follow Cephas, which is Peter. And still another says, I follow Christ. So we have this division going on. Think about Paul. He was not an eloquent speaker, he was not impressive, but he was the one who founded the church, okay? So you have a, a, a group of people who kind of coalesced around him. Then you have Apollo, and he, not Apollo, but Apollos, who was very, uh, he was anointed, but he was also a great orator. And then you have Cephas, Peter, well, obviously, he was with the Lord for three years walking with him. And so you had all these different groups kind of picking out their favorite teachers, apostles. And so there was division among them. So today we would probably have that, if that happened, we'd have all these different denominations. We'd have the denomination of Paul, the denomination of Apollos, the denomination you know, of Cephas. So there was division within the church. And you have to realize that, you know, spiritual elitism can be dangerous. Because when you think it's your group that has the absolute truth, you're heading down the wrong path. And I remember the, a story... So there was, a, there was an old Quaker who went from church to church to church trying to find and never could find the true church. So someone asked him one day, he said, well, where are you going now? And he said, I finally found the true church. And he said, oh, really? Well, how many are there? And he said, well, my wife and myself and I'm not sure about her all the time. So, you know, yes, that, that can be a dangerous thing. So spiritual elitism. So they had all this division going on with the different ones, people picking their favorite uh, teacher, their favorite apostle. So let's pick it back up in verse 13 through 17. And Paul says, okay, so is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? So obviously a lot of people were making a big deal about, well, I was baptized by Paul. Well, I was baptized by Peter. 
Well, I was baptized by Paulus. And so Paul says, I am thankful that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. So no one can say that you were baptized into my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So, so Crispus was one of the, back, going back to Acts 18, was one of the synagogue leaders who again got saved. So it's not that Paul didn't think uh, baptism was important. He just was saying that the most important thing was getting people saved, preaching the gospel. Because apparently there were some there, as are there are some denominations today, that don't believe you're actually saved until you've been baptized. And then that's when regeneration occurs. But he was being uh, forceful, saying, no, the most important part is witnessing getting people saved, making disciples. While we all should be baptized because it's, it's an outward sign of something that's been done inwardly, it is not what saves you. And he mentions a couple different, like in Romans uh, chapter 6, verse 3, Colossians 2, 12, where he's talking about baptism. So he wasn't against baptism at all. He was just saying that is not the most important part. All right, verse 18 and 19. And it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the intelligent of the intelligent I will frustrate. So think about the message of the cross is folly to those. And he quotes Isaiah 29, 14 there. So don't be surprised that sometimes if you're witnessing to others that people just kind of, they just don't get it. It's just like it, it's foolishness to them. This whole thing about this man Jesus being crucified and being crucified and, and by his blood you are saved, it's, you know, it's just foolishness to many. So unless the Lord opens their heart, it's just nonsense to them. So let's take 20 through 25. So he says, where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. And you can read the first chapter of Romans about that. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Now Jews demand a miraculous sign and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength." So the Jews had asked, remember when uh, the Jews had asked Jesus for a sign? Do us, show us a sign. And he said, I'm not going to give you any sign except the sign of Jonah. But he had been doing signs all through the three years. Healing the sick, casting out demons, multiplying food, raising the dead. And yet they're asking for a sign. Now, to the Gentiles, or to the Greeks, it was foolishness. 
Now, Corinth, being in the southern part of, um, of Greece, was on the, you might call it the, the conference circuit, because you'd have people from Athens and, and Corinth going back and forth. They're professional orators, philosophers, and they would come and people would pay to listen to them. And so the Greeks really valued what they thought was human intelligence, okay? And so the gospel is just foolishness to them. It's like it doesn't make sense. And for the Jew, a crucified Messiah was offensive to the unbelieving Jew. Now think about this. Think even back with the disciples, Jesus kept telling them, I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to be spit bombed. I'm going to be beaten. And, they're, and, you know, Peter goes, no, that's never going to happen to you, Lord. And then Jesus had to confront him and said, get behind me, Satan. So they really didn't even get it till after Jesus was crucified and had risen from the dead. So for the Jewish person, it, was, you know, it wasn't in their mind about a Messiah who's coming to die. They have a Messiah who's coming to rule and reign. To sit on the throne in Jerusalem and to rule the world. And when that didn't happen, even though it was hinted at throughout the Old Testament scriptures, most of them, most of the Jews, did not believe. They did not recognize the Messiah. And it was, as it says, a stumbling block. And I want to take a few minutes here to kind of show how through the Old Testament all the way through to the New Testament, we have this picture about a stumbling rock, a stumbling stone, a stumbling uh, block that they're going to stumble over. So I want to go all the way back to Isaiah. And since I have one hand, it'll take me a little longer here. But Isaiah chapter 8. And then we're going to kind of follow it through this same theme. Chapter 8 of Isaiah, verses 14 and 15. So this is God the Father talking about the Messiah who's coming. And he says, And he will be a sanctuary for both houses of Israel. In other words, the northern kingdom of Israel, southern kingdom of Judah. And he will be a stone that causes men to stumble. And a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. And many of them will stumble and will fall and be broken. And they will be ensnared and captured. So we have this about a rock that makes them fall. It makes them stumble. So we're going to see this same theme go throughout the Old Testament into the New Testament. So in verse uh, chapter 28 of Isaiah and verse 16. So this is what the Sovereign Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. For the one who trusts will never be dismayed. So this stone is going to be a stumbling block to some, but it will also be life and goodness to those who believe. So I want to turn over to the prophet Daniel. Daniel chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 31 through 35. So let me just kind of tell you what's happening here in chapter 2. So this is where Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. 
So he had a dream, so he calls all his wise men and uh, the Chaldeans and the magicians, and he calls them up and says, okay, I had a dream, and I want you to interpret it. First, I want you to tell me what my dream was, and then I want you to interpret it. And they go, what? Now, tell us the dream, and we'll interpret it. No, you tell me what my dream was, and then, then you can interpret it. And they said, well, no one's ever been able to do that. And so Nebuchadnezzar said, well, I'm going to kill all of you then. You either tell me the dream, or else you're all going to be executed. And that's where Daniel comes in the scene, and, and they're, Daniel finds out that they're about you know, they're going to kill all the wise men because he was one of them. And so he and his friends pray, and he basically gets a download. And the Lord downloads what the dream is. So he goes before Nebuchadnezzar, and we'll kind of pick up the story. Verse 31, and it says, so he's telling Nebuchadnezzar his dream. He says, you look, O king, and there before you stood a large statue an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thigh of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. Now, while you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and sit clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. So in his dream, he was, and this is actually repeated a couple different times with different images, but of four different kingdoms that were going to come. You know, the the Babylonian uh, Empire was there. The Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire was coming, and then the Roman Empire. So different pictures of the same story. But he says, this rock, not formed by human hands, struck the statue. All those kingdoms fall. But the rock fills the whole earth and goes on forever. So let's go to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 21. So we keep having this picture of the stone of the rock. Matthew chapter 21, going to look at verses 42 through 44. And it says, Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scripture the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone? And the Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whom it falls, it will be crushed. Now, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parable, they knew he was talking about them. So Jesus says, basically, he's saying, I am the stone. I am the stone. I am this rock that the builders have rejected. I'm that stone that all the Old Testament was talking about. I am that rock. I'm that stumbling stone. And I'm also the capstone. Okay, Gospel of Luke chapter 2.
Luke chapter 2, and we're just going to look at 1 verse 34. But before I get there, I'll tell you what's going on. So this is when uh, Mary and Joseph are bringing Jesus into the temple to be circumcised and be dedicated to the Lord. Okay, So there's a man there named Simeon who had been there most of his life, and the Lord had revealed to him that he would not die until he would see the Messiah. So they're bringing in Jesus, again, to have him circumcised and to dedicate him. And so in verse 34, Simeon says, Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against. So that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. So he says, this, this trial is destined to cause a falling and the rising of many. Acts chapter 4, we've just gone through the whole book of Acts. Acts chapter 4 and verses 10 through 11. Actually, I'm going to go back to verse 8, I think, because this is after Peter had done a miraculous healing. Peter and um, had been arrested, him and James had been arrested And it says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, If we are being called to account today for an act of kindness to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men which we must be saved. So again, he repeats, He is the stone that you builders rejected, and he has now become the capstone. So let's turn over to Romans, the next book. Romans chapter 9. And we're going to look at verses... 32 through 35. Actually, I start down at 32. Okay. So why not? Because, verse 32, they pursued it not by faith, he's talking about Jewish people, but if it were by works, they stumble over the stumbling stone. As it is written, see, I lay in Zion a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And no one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. So again, it causes men to stumble, but those who trust in him shall never be put to shame. Now one last one is First Peter. First Peter chapter 2. And verses 4 through 8. So Peter says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God, and precious to him, you also are like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, 
I lay in zone, I lay in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected, it has become a capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. So all through from the Old Testament to the New, we have this whole picture of a stone and a rock that's going to either cause people to stumble and fall or gives them life. And as is said in the, the earlier passage about how the Jews were looking through the law to reach that place, and yet we know that no one is made righteous by following the law. And so it, it's like a, a picture of, to me, like a dog that is chasing his tail, always trying Always trying to do more. Always trying to do what he's supposed to do and it can't ever get there. And then, because they're angry with themselves because of their failure, that anger then begins to turn outwardly against the others. And so that's why grace is such powerful news that we have to realize first that we cannot live that life. We are called to be holy. We are called, but if we try to earn it, we're never going to get there. We're never going to make it. We have to receive that grace, that unmerited favor. And so the stumbling block, it's a rock of offense to some people. It's a rock that they stumble over. But to those who believe, it is the power of God, and it is life. You know, later uh, uh, in 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about how it's a fragrance of death to one, the gospel. But to those who are being saved, it's a, it's a fragrance of life. Same thing. It's the same, you know, it's the same message but to one, it's a, it's a message of death. To another, it's a message of life. So throughout Scripture, we see this. He is put personally in there that he would be a stumbling block to many. But he is also the capstone. All right, let's go ahead and finish the chapter. Go back to... 1 Corinthians, and we're going to finish 26 to the rest. And it says, Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many influential. Not many were a noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world and the things that are despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. So no one may boast before the Lord. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that our righteousness and holiness and redemption. Therefore, it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So no human can boast in the presence of the Lord because it's all about him. It's all about his righteousness and not ours. It's about what he has done for us and not what we have done. And I think some of the people who have the hardest time coming to know the Lord are those who really think, you know, I'm better than most people. 
I really don't need a Savior. And that's why many times we have to preach the law for people to realize they are in need of a Savior, that they have all fallen short. None are righteous. And until we come to that place of realizing that and giving our life over and, and realizing that we need a Savior, that we all have fallen short of the glory of God. And so we have through this, you know, 1 Corinthians 1, we have this picture again of a church being formed. You know, they're taking off. But again, so many of them didn't have any background in the things of the Lord, especially the Gentiles. They had no moral compass, as it were. They were used to the life that they lived. And so there's many different issues that he has to address in these new churches as they're springing up. And so all through, you know, whether it's Galatians or Thessalonians, he's always dealing with issues coming up within the church. And these are issues that we can learn from their mistakes so that we don't do the same thing. And also we have this, this theme that goes through scriptures from the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament about the Lord being a rock of offense or a stumbling rock but also a capstone, and it was meant to be that way, and it has proven all the way through the Old Testament through the New. So, Lord, we just thank you for your word. Lord, that your word is rich, and, Lord, that you have given us so much, Lord, that we have today that those people didn't have. They didn't have the New Testament And so, Lord, they were, in a way, kind of feeling the way. And there were many issues and problems to deal with. And, Lord, we are, have been so blessed that, that, Lord, we have your word. We have Bibles available. We have your word to study, to learn. And, Lord, we are so grateful and thankful. And, Lord, as we read and as we think about the grace that has been given to us, it should create within us a great gratefulness of what you have done for us, how you have saved us, how you have brought us out of a place of darkness into your marvelous light. So, Lord, we thank you. We praise you for all that you've done. We thank you that you are the rock, that you are that stone, that you are the capstone that you have given us life and eternal life. And we say thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness and your goodness to us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen.